Hello, everyone, both on Zoom and in the room. It is so wonderful to be here today. Uh, my name is Dustin Hausner. I am the Jewish Outreach and Program Director at the Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey. Um, I also have wear a number of hats in my local community. I'm a member of my um, local NAACP. I'm part of a couple of different Jewish organizations. So it is so good to be here with you today. I'm going to be doing two presentations. Uh, one very detailed and then one a little bit on the shorter side. I'm going to pull up the presentation, so I'm going to put the share on. So the presentation is the Jewish responses to Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement. So the other day, literally yesterday, we celebrated Martin Luther King Day, which is the time where a lot of people play different clips from Martin Luther King's speeches, the I Have a Dream, a lot of people use quotes. Um, in a variety of different types of messaging, but what was the actual Jewish response to Martin Luther King, the Civil Rights Movement? You know, I know growing up, I was told that in, during the Civil Rights Movement, Martin Luther King came, there was a wonderful Jewish response in which Jews, along with members of the Civil Rights Movement, came together. We had this beautiful unity. Then around 1968, and really around the time of the Black Power Movement, started to get control, then it all kind of disintegrated. And over the years, we've been dealing with the backlash of that ever since. So I kind of want to go through some of the known figures during the Civil Rights Movement who were Jewish, talk a little bit about what was the actual views of the number of Jewish leaders at the time. So we, did, we do have an audio, but to be honest, I'm a little scared to try and do it. So uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was pro-Israel. He had spoken as such, and he also was someone who was vehemently anti-Zionist. He had said, that there were Jewish supporters who said he didn't have to speak about anti-Zionism, I mean anti-Semitism. And he said that he would, of course, speak on anti-Semitism, whether he was asked or not, because it was a moral obligation for him to speak on these issues. Okay, fingers crossed, we're gonna try the audio. So give me one second. All right. All right, here's a very brief audio. Let's see if it works. No, because it's muted. Your sound is done over there, so they can't hear it. Let's no. let's skip it because we have plenty of other stuff to go through, so it's it's not a problem. So, all right, we're going to go back to the presentation. Cool. Okay. So besides Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech, he actually said many famous speeches and had many different things that were written during his time. One of his most famous next to the I Have a Dream speech was his letter from Birmingham jail. Uh, raise your hand both in the chat, um, in the Zoom, and also in person here. Uh, who has actually ever read the speech? The letter from Birmingham jail. Okay, we got a few people, that's wonderful. And if you haven't, that's okay. A lot of, you know, throughout history, many people have written many things and some people have read them and some haven't. But what isn't talked about is actually Judaism is mentioned quite a few times in that particular letter. So I want to read a few excerpts from it. So this was back when he was in jail, Birmingham jail, uh, April 16th, 1963. So one part of it says segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, for those of you who don't know, Martin Buber was a very famous Jewish philosopher. Um, he was Austrian, he was a pacifist, he wrote the famous um, I Thou, which he's about to reference. So Jewish philosopher Martin Buber substitutes an I-it relationship, in other words, the individual and an object, to a relationship for the I Thou, which is the inner relationship connection, and ends up regulating persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, and socially unsound, it is morally wrong and sinful. So he's using a Jewish philosopher's ideology to point out the injustices of segregation. We should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I'm sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. So obviously, unless you're in the situation, you won't know, but he's making the point 
that in Germany it was legal to discriminate and have these unjust laws, and it was illegal to be a freedom fighter. And he sees his actions along those same lines as it may be illegal, but it is just, it is morally right. And then the next part is probably one of the more famous parts of the Birmingham jail letter, which is about the idea of the white moderate. So this is probably one of his most famous sections. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the, citizen, the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you and your goal, you see, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. A shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And then he also, made, so at that section, he makes the point that there are people who say, you know what, I support civil rights, but I don't agree with how you're going about it. And this is his frustration in saying that there, he has people who say they're allies, but won't actually go out and do the actions that are necessary. And in fact, say that, oh, you've got to wait your turn, this isn't the right time. You know, the questioning of when is it a good time to have justice? When is it a good time to be seen as a person? And the last line I'll mention is um, part of the speech, uh, part of the letter, excuse me. Rabbis of the South would be among our strongest allies. Instead, some have been outright opponents, refusing to understand the freedom move movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more uh, cautious than courage and have remained silent behind the anesthesia security of stained glass windows. In other words, one of his complaints was that Martin Luther King that he was surprised that Southern rabbis were not standing up with him. He would have thought that they were brothers in the cause for freedom and civil rights. But there were a number of reasons why that was. First of all, there were people who were Jewish who did support segregation. You know, there was uh, Judah Benjamin, who was, the sec who was one of the secretaries of state for the Confederacy. There were Jews who supported that ideology. But also, there were Jews who wanted to be safe. They had just, we just had a Holocaust a few decades ago. And the idea of speaking out made a lot of Jews uncomfortable. They thought it would be very dangerous. They thought they could have their lives ruined. So there were plenty of Jews who sat on the sidelines. So there were many different Jewish dichotomies of the period. Who we remember. So this is probably one of the most famous Jews that you learn about when we talk about Jews and the civil rights movement, which is of course Rabbi Abraham Joshua, Joshua Heschel who you can see him marching with uh, Salma to Montgomery marches and also the protest against the Vietnam War in 1968. So I won't go through the whole biography, but he was a very well-learned, very respected rabbi in many institutions. He was involved in many federal organizations. He was involved in many Jewish movements. He famously, and I'm paraphrasing, talked about you know, how he prayed through his walking, his steps when he did the marches. So he was probably one of the most well-known figures. And in fact, in the early, I would say it would be the 50s, he did a very famous speech, you, I don't have it here, but you can look it up online, uh, called Race and Religion, where he makes the argument that as Jews, we are ordained by God to fight for you know, racial justice, for equality, that it is wrong for us to support racism. I highly recommend if you have the time to look it up. Um, again, it's by Ra Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. It is um, religion and uh, race and religion. It's a very good speech. So the other person we remember is Rabbi Jacob Prince. So he was one of the speakers during the March on Washington. You sometimes see him in a few documentaries, but not all of them. He did a beautiful speech. Um, I was originally gonna play the audio, but obviously we were having some technical difficulties. But just to give you a brief biography of him, he was born in a village um, in the Prussian province. He was 21 years old when he received his PhD in philosophy and had minored 
in art history at the University of Lessen. He was ordained as a rabbi by the Jewish Theological Seminary of Breslau. Um, as his prominence grew in Germany and his fears of Hitler's reign coming to fruition, he earned the sponsorship of Rabbi Stephen Weiss, who was very famous at the time. He was a close advisor to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, Rabbi Weiss was. In 1937, Prince immigrated to the United States. He immediately began lecturing throughout the U.S. and for the United Palestinian Appeal, establishing in the 1920s as the fundraising arm for the United States for the Jewish Agency for Israel. It was essentially the precursor to what became the American Jewish support based for the nation state of Israel and the United Israel Appeal. So he was a very influential person at the time. He did a very beautiful speech um, at it. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll just read one or two excerpts. America must not become a nation of onlookers. America must not remain silent, not merely black America, but all of America. It must speak up and act from the president down to the humblest of us and not for the sake of the Negro, but for the sake of the black community, but for the sake of the image, the idea and the aspiration of America itself. Our children, yours and mine in every school across the land, each morning pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the Republic for which it stands. They, the children speak fervently and innocently of this land as the land of liberty and justice for all. The time I believe has come to work together for it is not enough to hope together. It is not enough to pray together, to work together that the children's oath pronounced every morning from Maine to California, from North to South may become a glorious unshakable reality in the morally renewed and united America. So you can actually find his speech, the audio online. It's about seven minutes long, highly recommend it. But as with all audio of the period, it's a bit groggy. So you might want to be in a very quiet space when you listen to it. Another famous case was the murder of Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney. Uh, this was a very famous incident. Uh, basically, these three individuals who were part of uh, the civil rights movement who were down to register voters to go out and vote. They were stopped by police who then killed and tortured them. This was a very famous case in which the FBI came down and made very national headlines at the time. They were part of the 1964 Mississippi uh, Summer Project, which was trying to register people in Mississippi to go out and vote. So I wanna, this is actually um, a part where we're gonna see, we're gonna see if you can answer a few questions for me. So these are reaction to civil rights and black power. So these are a couple of organizations um, at the period that were very influential. There was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee known as SNCC, CORE, Congress of Racial Equality, NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, American Jewish Congress, War Resisters League, Leadership Conference of Civil and Human Rights, SCLS, uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. So we have this quote up here, and I'm going to read it, and everyone can see it on the screen, both screens. Uh, all right, I'm going to read from here. A segregated system is not merely an unfair system, but it is a waste and inefficient system. Nevertheless, we do not believe that federal law to equalize educational opportunities by public subsidy should be used as a means to attack the segregated uh, school system. So long as the law guarantees that states have segregated school systems, do not discriminate financially against children in the minority school, we believe that the bill should be supported. So in other words, this is saying that there should be federal funds going to school, that the segregation system, as long as the money is being distributed equally, segregation should be taken down. So I have uh, three questions. You can answer in the chat if you're watching from Zoom and in person if you want to raise your hand. So first of all, does this person, based on what I just said, do you think they support civil rights? So the person is talking about not ending the segregated system of schools. So do you think the person is pro-civil rights or anti-civil rights? So anybody want to raise their hand? So yes, so the person is pro-segregated education. So would you say they would be pro or anti-civil rights? Okay, so we would say against, does everyone agree? Okay, most people seem to agree. All right, uh, was this said by a segregationist, a Jewish leader, or an African-American leader? Who do you think actually said this quote? Again, it's promoting the idea that the segregation 
segregated system should stand as long as it's distributed equally financially. Okay, we got a couple in the room that are saying segregationists. Let me see if anyone's responded in the chat. Okay, we got anti-civil rights, right? Okay, civil, right, civil rights, Jewish leader, 1960s, okay. And then again, the decade where this was said. So someone said 1960s. Uh, do you all agree that this was said in the 1960s or do you think this could have been said beforehand? So let's see who's, uh, who's good at history. So some say 1960s, anyone else? Okay. Let me just take a look in the chat. Okay, so the answer for this one it is Rabbi Stephen S. Weiss. So 1947, this was said to Congress. So for those of you who don't know who he was, Stephen S. Weiss was a reform rabbi. He was the founder of the New York Federation of Zionist Societies in 1897, which led to the formation of the National Federation of American Zionists. He was the forerunner of the Zionist Organization of America. And at the Second Zionist Congress, he was a delegate of secretary for the English language. He was a co-founder of the NAACP in 1914, very good friends with Theodore Roosevelt. There's a couple of books about it. And he was the president of the American Jewish Congress in the 1930s. So, okay, so this was a Jewish leader who just said something pro-segregation in the 1940s. There's actually a reason why he did this. So this was right after World War II, and the United States knew they needed to have the next generation of scientists, mathematicians. They wanted to go against the new threat, which were the communists. So there were big discussions about, you know, where federal funding was going to go and who's going to get it. So Rabbi Weiss, who was a very well-respected figure at the time, said, this is a no-brainer. We want federal funding in schools. He went out. He spoke to the Congress at a select committee, spoke for it. Then there was a deliberation. And a number of Southern senators went to him and say, look, this is not going to move past committee. The fact is, if you give federal funds to all schools, then the next thing you're going to do is desegregate. And the next thing you're going to do is make sure, you know, certain allocations are not going to be done the right way. So we want to propose a friendly amendment that makes clear that Southern schools have an exemption. That basically, if you want to give federal funding to all schools, great. But in the South, we kind of get to do our own thing. And Rabbi Weiss had a tough decision to make. Was he going to support school funding in which schools all across the country would get fed, better funding and better education? Or would he take a stand for what would later become the civil rights movement but for African-Americans in dealing with segregation? He spoke, as you saw in the quote, uh, pro the revised bill. He made a very tough decision based on the reality of the times. And there were many Jews who had tough decisions like this, where they had the question of, you know, where, how far do I go? How much does it hurt my community? Is there an endangerment? So the quote may seem odd for him, but in the context of the period, it was a very tough decision. And I wanted to show that because there's this idea of this natural Jewish alliance that came upon, and it, it wasn't quite as simple as that. So another quote I have, the positive aspect of black power is its search for ethnic identity. This we should be able to understand and approve. The American black today is in, in this respect, retracing previously the experience of American Jews a generation or two ago. So in other words, this person seems to be saying that the black power movement is something that is almost like a natural thing to happen. And we as Jews did this a number of years ago, this idea of just our own version of it. So, so my question is first, does the person in the statement support black power? Okay, people in the room seem to be nodding their heads. I'm checking here. Okay, there seems to be a few people that are doing that as well. Okay, was this said by a Jewish leader or African-American leader? Okay. Okay. So do, raise your hand if you think it was a Jewish leader that said this, okay? How about African-American leader? Okay, so we have some who say Jewish, some say African-American. And my question from earlier, what decade do you think this was? Okay, we got 70s. Um, anyone else, what decade do we think this, this statement is from? 60. 1960. Okay, we got 70s again. 60. Let me look in the chat and see if anyone, we got 70s again. Okay, very good. Thank you all for your answer. So let us find out the correct answer. This was by Robert 
Rabbi Ronald Gitzelin, 1969. So I, for those who said 70s, we'll give you some credit on that. So for the statement, um, he was ordained at the Hebrew Union College in 1936. He was the first served as the Central Synagogue of Nassau County in Rockville Center, New York, before becoming senior and later Rabbi Emeritus in, at Temple Israel in Boston, MA. Uh, among the host of responsibilities and many honors he occurred throughout his life, he served as president of the Central Conference of American Rabbis and Association of Reform Zionists of America among a number of other wonderful accomplishments they did included, he managed a stint as a chaplain at the United States Marine Corps. Um, he was later awarded three combat ribbons for his service with the 5th Marine Division on Imo, Imo Jima. Uh, beyond these distinctions, um, he's also chaplain, has been participatory, celebrated because of his eulogy he delivered at the 5th Division ceremony. So why am I telling you all this? For many people, part of the narrative that as Jews we were taught in school is we had this great relationship during the civil rights movement around 1968 when Martin Luther King was assassinated and black power suddenly became this larger movement. That's when the desertion happened. And a lot of people claim that it just it came out of nowhere, that Jews were blindsided by it. It was devastating, it was hurtful, which there were plenty of Jews who felt that way. But this is a good example of a Jewish leader who actually not only saw the black power movement coming, but he actually understood or saw that there were many similarity traits between what they were doing and what had been happening in the Jewish community. So it was a very interesting statement and it goes against the idea of kind of the blindsidedness and the idea against Black Power Movement at the time. So I have one more, I have one more quote. I'm tired of the philosophy of rich white men toward your race. I want to see you fight your own battles with your own leaders and your own money. We white men of whatever creed or faith cannot fight your battles for you. We will stand shoulder to shoulder with you until you can fight as generals all by yourself. So in other words, this seems to be a white person saying that when it comes to your fights, your movement, we can support, but we can't lead it. In other words, you have to be able to self-sustain. You have to be able to do things on your own. So it's kind of a very black power type ideology, to be honest. So let me ask you first. Does this per person support civil rights? Okay, a number of people are nodding yes. Uh, let me check on the Zoom. Uh, do you think the person is, oh, ah, go back. I was gonna say a little too early on that one. So, but I, but I don't think you saw the name. I don't think you saw the name. I don't think it was that good. All right, um, was the person a segregationist, Jewish leader or African-American leader? And again, you're, for those that are watching on Zoom, um, you can put your answers in the chat, please. So what do we think? Segregationist, Jewish leader, or African-American leader? Okay, was an African-American leader. Okay, anyone else? Okay, we're getting segregationist. All right, anyone else? Jewish leader, all right. All right, and then last one, what decade was this? So again, the idea was that as rich white men need to get out of the way and let black communities basically be able to take care and do things themselves. So what decade do you think this is from? We got 40s, okay, anyone else? All right, anyone in the, anyone in the Zoom? Okay, you're, you're all still watching and still awake. I appreciate that, thank you. I appreciate the two people that laughed at that joke and, and in the room too. All right, so the answer is this is Joel Springarn, who was one of the co-founders of the NAACP in 1914. So he helped create the NAACP and actually fun fact, uh, for those who don't know, the NAACP was actually founded by a multitude of different people, including several Jews actually. actually. Actually, as a matter of fact, a number of Jews have been president of the NAACP, very interesting history. But hmm, he had received several honors throughout his life, but I wanna highlight the year he said this. He was a Jewish leader in 1914, long before the Black Power Movement was even a thing, there were Jewish leaders who understood or who believed that in order for communities to be able to get to a certain point, they need to be able to do things themselves. That as allies, we can help, but they need to lead their own movements. They need to do their own thing. So I wanna highlight this because this is an example of a number of Jewish leaders who prior to a lot of the movements that would come later already had some of these thoughts. 
which was something that's very anti what the narrative has told us, is that it was a huge surprise. So I want to briefly talk about two quick examples. I just want to check my watch to make sure I'm not going over. Oh, we're doing perfect timing. So I want to point out two examples of what we in the Jewish community took from the civil rights movement. All right, raise your hand, and I'm watching in the chat, in the Zoom too. How many people have actually read the Jewish catalog? Any version of it? Okay, we got a few people in the room. How about on Zoom? Anybody ever read the Jewish catalog? No? Okay. If you can find a copy, which you can usually do at like uh, certain Jewish libraries. Um, I actually worked in uh, the Wayne YMCA. So, so, oh, if you, or if you have it in here, that's fantastic too. So think of it as a uh, How to Be Jewish for Dummies book but obviously it won't say dummies in it, but it literally would go through to you, you know, how to do Shabbat, you know, how, what clothing to wear, what holidays you celebrate. It was a very basic can do book series that I think there were about four or five copies of it, but that was something very much taken out of the black power movement. The idea of, you know, how do we as Jews become more engaged in our Jewish ethnic identity. What are the things we have to do? What are the things we get involved with? So one of the things we took from it was this Jewish ethnic identity movement, the idea of, okay, what does it mean to be Jewish and how do we show our Jewish pride? And the second, which I'm sure some of you will be familiar with, is the American Soviet Jewry movement. If you, if you looked at that sign, if I got rid of the language on the signs and put pro-civil rights signs, you wouldn't know the difference. Whether it came to the busings that happened, for the uh, American Soviet Jewry movement that was done, whether it was the speakers, whether it was the rallies, a lot of the same tactics that were used during the American Soviet Jewry movement were used uh, by the civil rights movement. So these are two very concrete examples of things we took from the civil rights movement. So this is the end of this part of the presentation. I'm about to show you part of, um, I'm gonna do a presentation as requested about Tu B'Shvat. But before we do that, I do want to give an opportunity for any uh, questions, comments um, about this part of the presentation. So, uh, yes, we have someone in the room. So this was so what was asked just now was more of an anecdote about the close relationship between Rabbi Heschel and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And you know how MLK is Melek. So there's that beautiful and even for one of uh, Rabbi Heschel's birthday, I think you said the rabbinical assembly, correct? Okay. And it was also mentioned that uh, Rabbi Wolf Kilman, who was a conservative rabbi, also marched with Martin Luther King, had a good relationship uh, as well. Is that an accurate description of what you just said? I just want to make sure I'm saying it correctly. Okay, um, anyone else? Uh, anecdote, comments? Uh, yes, please. So what was brought up was um, Rabbi Heschel, when asked about him marching during Shabbat, was um, you know why he was doing it. And he says that he was marching with his feet, uh, which is a very famous quote that he said. And it was, oh, praying with his feet, my apologies. So uh, praying with his feet, which actually there's been a couple of documentaries where the children of Heschel have verified that that was an actual true thing that he said. So that's not one of those mythical things. He actually did say that. So, okay. So what is Tu B'Shvat? So the name of this festival is actually its date. Tu is the pronunciation of the Hebrew letter for the number 15, and it falls in the Hebrew month of Shevet. Traditionally, Tu B'Shvat uh, was not a Jewish festival. Rather, it marked an important date for Jewish farmers in ancient times, which, fun fact, if you look at the Jewish calendar, it's mainly lunar with some sun with some solar, but part of the challenge of the Jewish calendar, for those who are familiar, was that there are certain things in the Torah that mark that this has to happen on this time, or this has to happen this season. So credit where credit is due, the uh, rabbis and the others who created the Jewish calendar, a lot of complexities. One of it was a lot of things said in scripture of when certain holidays have to take place. But anyway, uh, the Torah states, when you enter the land of Israel and plant any tree for food, you shall regard its fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden for you not to be eaten, Leviticus 19.23. The fruit of the fourth year was to be offered to the priests in the temple as a gift of gratitude for the bounty of the land. And the fifth year, fruit and all subsequent fruit was finally for the farmer. This law, however, raised the question of how farmers were to mark the birthday of the tree. The rabbis therefore established the fifth of the month of Shevet as a general birthday for all trees, regardless of when they were actually planted. 
at a later time, the rabbis of the Talmud established four new years uh, throughout the Jewish calendar. Rosh Hashanah, of course, for the Jewish New Year for the calendar date, a new year for establishing the reign of kings, a new year for tithering animals of Jewish farmers to be given to the temple, and finally, Tu Bishvat, uh, the new year for the trees uh, from the Mishnah, uh, Rosh Hashanah 1-1. Rabbis discussed why this date was chosen, saying that Tu B'Shvat falls after midwinter, usually in February. Um, so it's January now, but as we all know, Jewish calendar it can you know fluctuate depending on the year. Uh, they concluded that the majority of the annual rainfall was usually already fallen by that time in the land of Israel, thus yielding a healthy waterlogged soil in which new plant, new plant tree, new yeah, to, to which plant new trees. Uh, Tama Rosh Hashanah 14. In medieval times, Kabbalist Jews, uh, Jewish mystics, gave uh, Tu B'Shvat greater spiritual significance, seeing in Tu B'Shvat a vehicle for mystical ideas. The Kabbalists imbued Tu B'Shvat with new religious significance, as well as created um, elaborate new symbolic rituals. We'll talk about the Seder a little bit. Um, according to Lernik uh, Kabbalah, which is a form of mysticism studied by the students of uh, Isaiah Gloria, Gloria, who some people might be familiar with, all physical forms, including human beings, uh, hide within themselves a spark of divine presence. Uh, this is similar to some ideas of uh, kinds of fruits and nuts, uh, which hide within them seed of new life and potential growth. In Jewish mysticism, uh, human actions can release these sparks and help increase God's presence in the world. On Tu B'Shvat, the Kabbalists would eat certain fruits associated with the land of Israel as a symbolic way to release these divine sparks. In modern times, uh, Tu B'Shvat has become a symbol of both a Zionist attachment to the land of Israel, as well as an example of the Jewish sensitivity to the environment. Uh, early Zionist settlers um, to Israel began planting trees, not only to restore the ecological and ancient Israel, uh, but as a symbol of renewed growth of the Jewish people returning to their ancestral homeland. While relatively few Jews continue to observe the Kabbalist Tu B'Shvat Seder, many Americans and European Jews observe Tu B'Shvat by contributing money to Jewish National Fund, an organization de devoted to de reforestating Israel, um, as well as other Jewish agencies that do environmental work. Uh, for environmentalists, uh, Tu B'Shvat is an ancient and authentic Jewish Earth Day uh, that, educator, that educates Jews about the Jewish traditions, advocacy of responsibility, stewardship of God's creation as manifested in ecological activism, uh, among them, contemporary versions of the Tubishvat Seder emphasizes environmental concerns and it is gaining popularity, which I will say in recent years, I know more and more people that celebrate Tubishvat than previously. So there actually is a wonderful uptick. And I will, I was asked the other day when I was telling some friends about that, um, should you sue because Tubishvat was the first Earth Day? So someone took it 50 years ago and they didn't know the history of it. So um, I told them that we can, we have Tu B'Shvat, they have Earth Day, we can also make it one. Um, so I mentioned the origin of Tu B'Shvat. So one of the things you are supposed to do on Tu B'Shvat, I say that loosely because people do Tu B'Shvat celebrations a little differently, is you're supposed to read passages that talk about planting trees, um, talk about plants. You can also talk about, you know, the holiday itself. So for example, where is Tu B'Shvat mentioned in the Tanakh? It is not mentioned there at all. I mentioned earlier that is mentioned in the Mishnah as mentioned above. You can try and find out, you know, when certain things were uh, done. So I'm not gonna be cruel and have you answer this question, but I just wanted you to know that I had this question, which was on Tu B'Shvat is customary to eat and serve the seven species mentioned in the Torah. Can you name all of the seven species? So um, I'm going to spare everyone here and not answer and uh, not have you answer that part, but I do have one or two questions I do want answered. So for those of you who don't know, um, on Tu B'Shvat is customary to eat these, and that includes wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, and dates. Uh, the seven species come from De Deuteronomy 8.8, 8, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and date honey, uh, which was actually one of the interesting things I learned about Tu B'Shvat was, you know, people having date honey versus the honey we think of today, which actually date honey is quite good. It's just very sweet if any of you have ever had it. So a very quick uh, Tu B'Shvat question for the Seder, which I think we have enough time. So when it comes to Tu B'Shvat Seder, we either A, eat fruits and nuts with hard outside and edible inside, like walnuts, almonds, pomegranates, 
pistachios or coconuts? Do we eat fruits with soft exteriors and pits at their center, like olives, apricots, cherries, and plums? C, do we eat fruits that are entirely edible, such as raisins, grapes, strawberries, and raspberries? D, do we smell things which are invisible to the eye? Um, instead of eating fruit, uh, we enjoy like sweet smells like cinnamon, rosemary, or bay leaf, or E, all the above. All of the above. All right, so we got an all of the above here. Anyone else? A, B, C, or D, or, or E, excuse me. So what do we think? E. E. All right. We got a B, we got an all of the above here. All right, so the answer is all of the above. So during the Seder, you ha have uh, three plates that are one with the nuts on hard on the outside, edible on the inside, one plate that is soft exteriors with pin side, a third plate that is fruit that is entirely edible. And then some people, but not all people, do the fourth plate, which is really sweet uh, smell. So it's believe so each of these has different Kabbalistic beliefs to them of why we do these things. Others have it be based on Jewish personalities, you know, hard on the outside, soft on the inside, and different things such as that. So, and this is what I just mentioned. Okay. So for a Tubishmat Seder, how many cups do we drink? Do we drink one cup of a drink, two, three, or four? This is A, B, and C. So we got, we got a four over here. We got a four, as many as we want. Someone's going to have a good time tonight. All right. Uh, so um, anyone else? Um, do we have one cup, two, three, or four? Three. We got three. All right. Anyone else? Going once. Going twice. All right, sold. So the answer is actually four cups. So each one you do something different. So the first cup you have white grape juice, which is meant to symbolize the winter. Then the second cup you put a little bit of red grape juice or wine, depending on the personal preference and if you can have alcohol, um, where it's the awakening of the spring. Third cup is you have kind of like a half and half situation where it's uh, red and white, where it's the mid spring. And then the fourth cup is all red, which is the vibrance of, of course, like the end of spring. So let me just check the watch to see how we're doing on time. Okay. So we're going to kind of jump a little bit. So a couple of recommended readings um, for anyone who's very really interested in Tubishvat. Um, Chabad has a wonderful article on uh, Tu B'Shvat Seders. Um, you can also go to uh, Jew uh, Ecology. My Jewish Learning, um, I will give a shout out to them because they are a website that I go to quite a bit. They are an excellent source for anyone, especially who doesn't know a lot about Judaism or first time introductions. My Jewish Learning is an excellent website. Uh, PJ Library, of course, um, Chabad.org. And there is actually a couple of books on Tu B'Shvat and how to do a proper Seder. Uh, one plug I'm going to do for Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey, because that's where I'm from. Um, they're doing this wonderful community survey right now, um, asking everyone to, to participate online. It's not just for Federation, it's for the advantage of all the Jewish communities. But if you can take the time, if you go onto the website, literally just jfnnj.org, you scroll down, it, um, you just click on it, it takes a few minutes, but it's a wide survey. It's um, everything is held privately. It's just to help better engage with the Jewish community. And again, the information will be with our partners as well. Um, just very quickly, there are different passages you could read on Tu Bishvat, which is actually a very popular thing to do. Uh, Genesis 129, uh, which is one of my personal favorites. Uh, Behold, I have given you every herb yielding seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree that has seed yielding fruit to you, it shall be food. Um, as well as from uh, Leviticus and from uh, Deuteronomy. There's a lot of different uh, Talmudic thoughts um, and uh, Kabbalah's thought in regards to the importance of the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, the burning bush, a lot of references in our scripture about different types of plants. Uh, I'm going to skip the Honi full circle story, though for those of you who may know it, the Honi circle story is a really nice um, folklore tale about the importance of planting trees for the next generation. So highly recommend looking that up. And I think that's about it. So I want to open it up if anyone has any questions about Tu um, Otherwise, I can also go back and do answering questions for the previous presentation before she gets the giant uh, stick and boots me out. So <laughs> oh, comment. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, um, no. So it was mentioned how you know in Judaism we have certain years we are supposed to be able to eat certain plants and not, and how this year is one of those years where we wouldn't be. We would be preserving it. So very interesting. So see, very good history there. Um, anyone, anyone else about Tubishvats or Judaism and the Civil Rights Movement? Uh, one thing I'll just point out briefly about Tubishvat is a lot of people who are uh, vegetarians and vegans, especially who are Jewish, have adopted the holiday uh, due to you know the idea of plant-based eating, and you know they'll talk about you know kashrut, you know the restrictions of meat versus and uh, dairy versus plants and things like that. So one of the cool things about Tubishvat and one of the cool things about the, the minor holidays is there's a lot of opportunities for creativity to it, which are really cool. I actually did a presentation a couple months ago on the history of Hanukkah in the United States. Um, and one of the great things about Hanukkah is that besides lighting the menorah and doing the prayers, you can kind of do what you want, your own customs, things like that. So it's one of the many reasons it's been able to thrive and survive all these years. So um, any questions, comments, concerns? No? Thank you. Okay. okay just, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this terrific presentation. It was really interesting. And um, maybe we'll see. Maybe yeah. you'll come again. Yeah, happy to. Happy to. <laughs>